So the first question here is, and this is the most abstract of all of them, and that's why I gave them a potential kind of exception of going into the text to find specific um, evidence. So what should get us thinking? Uh, what reasons compel admission to wrongdoing, and uh, what does each accomplish? So what are your thoughts on this? Um, so we kind of just made a list of all the different reasons that would make someone kind of confess to their wrong wrongdoing. Um, so uh, they are like guilt, feeling that you have done wrong <laughs> and wanting to own up to it, kind of having that pressure on your mind. Um, remorse, feeling bad or regret for what you've done and trying to fix it or get justice. Uh, being exposed. So your wrongdoing becomes public knowledge, and when trapped, you're kind of forced to confess. Um, should I sh no. um, yeah. One we had pride and ego, so you refuse to believe you've done wrong, um, but are instead proud, proud of your actions. Um, in admit because of wanting attention um, and then kind of like a self-preservation one where or being bribed I guess where you confess because you're trapped and you want a way to lessen your punishment um, I guess on accident kind of slips out uh, I'll do the last one and um, gaining trust, so telling your secret or wrongdoing to someone to gain their trust. Um, and I'll do this with each of these questions to see if there's any other comments from you guys, but I, I want them in particular, but all of us really to start thinking about what are the reasons we admit to guilt? Uh, and they can be very different. And they, some can be very selfish reasons, and some can be very selfless reasons, and some can be a weird combination of both just to start thinking about that. Um, the novel proper is going to end with some level of confession. Um, that I would say a, a selfish confession. And the epilogue ends with really um, a selfless um, confession of, some, of sorts. Um, so hopefully you just start kind of thinking uh, about that a little bit. Okay. So this is the last time in the novel, and he leaves on page 404. Um, how does this make narrative and symbolic sense? So you well, what he says as he leaves is, but I told you myself that I was vacating today, Andrei Sebyan, mm, Semyonovich, and it was you who were trying to keep me here. Now I should only add that you are a fool, sir. I hope you may find a cure for your wits and your weak-sighted eyes. Excuse me, gentlemen. You go. Would you like to start? You can talk. Okay, um, <laughs> so um, I said narratively, kind of just makes sense that he kind of leaves because he doesn't really have any connection to anyone now. He's, his relationship with um, Dadya is gone, just, um, and there's, it's really, really gone now, I guess, and also his um, relationship with Sonia, just in the fact that he gave her money, is gone. Um, and then symbolically, I kind of was thinking about him as a vampire because on the page before it calls him pale and um, I was saying that symbolically he's kind of gone because he's failed to kind of find a, like a prey um, as you know he kind of tried to um, manipulate the Raskolnikov family by lying about where um, Raskolnikov gave the money and then he tried to do a similar thing with Sonia so he's kind of failed um, to kind of prey on these families, so he kind of has nothing to go off of anymore. Yeah, and this is kind of like his last ditch effort yeah. to potentially resurrect something with Dunya. He thinks if he can make Sonya look this bad, it's in, therefore going to make Raskolnikov look that bad um, to the family, um, and, and think that any advice that they had received from Raskolnikov about Lusion would be... It's kind of desperate. Nah. Yeah, and then that, yeah, yeah, it's pretty desperate. That entire meal ends up kind of mirroring the uh, original meal, with basically his accusations being discounted as fraud, and then him being pushed out with the crowd turning against him. 
any other thoughts on this one? You guys have any questions or ideas about this? Um, more of that symbolic uh, question. Um, you probably know by now by things I've said that Skolnikov kind of turns out okay in the end. Um, and there is this um, pushing off of, I don't know, evil in the text, and that's manifested in different ways. So it makes sense for a character who is a, one of the minor characters representative of those forces to just, just vacate. Um, and then we also need to figure out maybe, if, if that's the, the track going forward, then how, do, how does Fidrigailov do that as well? Um, and, and how did they get to a place where it's just, you know, the good forces mm -hmm. left Sanya kind of working on Raskolnikov rather than Sanya and Svitrigailov kind of butting heads over him. Cool. Um, so this question, consider for a moment that Sanya represents something metaphysical, so some kind of force. And this is difficult because I'm saying she's not a character anymore. She's just this idea or force. Um, how can you understand the text and specifically the chapter in Sanya's apartment? Um, what do you think? So um, it took us a while to really think about what Sonya represented, but um, looking back at the book, she's always been a character who has really appealed to Raskolnikov's human side, and she definitely like represents a lot of like his like emotional and spiritual self. So she kind of like appeals to his like morality, but also like this religious side of like forgiveness and absolution, mm -hmm. I guess. And she also is kind of religious and represents kind of religion and, um, you know, he confesses to her and she forgives him and she's like the last, like, one of the few people who can forgive him and um, really feels for him and feels the guilt that he has, so, yeah. How does, so Svidra Gela, uh, he kind of drops these bombs at the end of chapter five, or part five. Both, I guess, chapter five, season part five, and um, it's just like, what do we do with that? Um, you know, thinking of, you know, pre-thinking, thinking about what's to come. How does that work? So, how does Fujigalas offer allow the plot to continue? Um, maybe we can start by saying, what is the offer? Uh, what does it allow that otherwise might not be able to happen? Um, and how does Fujigalas hint at Raskolnikov's misdeeds? Um, uh, how do those push the plot forward? Just kind of thinking of his role at the end of this. It is no, you know, small thing to kind of overlook. <coughs> oh, you can go. I just okay. had a bad throat. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we thought Svidrigailov's offer, like, it was interesting to consider his motives, and Raskolnikov actually asked, like, what's the point of you giving all this money? Well, the offer is to um, pay a certain sum of money to have the children sent to an orphanage to kind of relieve some fiscal pressure from Sonia. Um, and we think that Svidrigailov was trying to get an upper hand over Raskolnikov. Um, he kind of, well, I think he's going to eventually blackmail Raskolnikov with this knowledge. Um, but it was interesting to see how uh, Raskolnikov reacted when he found out that Svidrigailov knows that he committed the murder because he willingly confessed to Sonya, but then when when Svidrigailov says, oh, I know your secret, he gets really, like, afraid. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to consider how that's going to affect him in the future um, and how Svidrigailov is going to use this, um, use this secret to manipulate Raskolnikov to maybe get Dunya or Sonya for himself um, or just, like, put him in this, like, uh, guilty state with, like, a lot of external pressure. Um, and then, metaphorically... Um, Svidrigailov brings uh, Raskolnikov into this corner to kind of like lay out the plan and like threaten him sort of um, so then he's like physically drawing him into a corner and then also cornering him so um, in terms of moving the plot forward how Raskolnikov is going to try to get out of the physical and metaphorical corner Sonya's room uh, and elsewhere. How does this paradox of hateful love make sense? Um, what chapter is this? It's like chapter four. Four. Yeah. Um, 
several times, uh, if you look on the back side, I've noted that in chapter four, something, there's at least these four pages that I think for the first time in the novel there's a mention of Raskolnikov's soul. He had a soul. Um, and I think it's no small part um, that that is there and it's paired with this idea of um, a love, but a love that doesn't come easy um, for him. So what do you guys think about this one? So, you guys, right? Yeah. yeah. So I feel that Sonia is kind of torn because she is such a devout Christian and she is such a pure figure who's kind of uh, subjected to you know, vampires as we've seen in previous chapters. But then she learned Raskolnikov committed the murder and she is horrified that he did it and that he did it purely for himself. But she's also kind of excited because he might be able to confess and might be able to become pure again. Um, and she's excited also that she can be forgiven as well for what she has done. Um, in one part, she's excited because they can both suffer together and bear the cross together. Um, yeah, and sort of on that religion aspect as well, you have the, the duplicity of the two characters with uh, the angel and devil as to uh, Sonya and Raskolnikov. Um, and how it's it's similar to that paradox of love hate um, that is mentioned in the prompt. Um, also, moving on, um, there's this uh, the it's kind of a little bit of both of the questions that we had was how um, Raskolnikov felt bad. Well, he he said it was a strange and terrible feeling to be loved by Sonia because he's making her suffer more than she already is by sharing this secret with her and Raskolnikov, yes they're kind of bonding over their suffering but uh, Raskolnikov um, hates Sonia in a way for loving um, him for what he's done, well, not for what he's done but even with what he's done and for allowing herself to be made even more miserable. Um, uh, make me think the, the yeah, about the and uh, this love's kind of is based on uh, Raskolnikov's redemption. Um, Sonia knows that if Raskolnikov can confess publicly, then she herself feels better. Um, unlike the Superman theory of R Raskolnikov testing himself, Sonia's almost testing Raskolnikov for herself, mm -hmm. and that's clearly something she wants. She says, you need to go in, you know, where there are people, and you need to admit to this there. Uh, what about this last question, just taking it head on? How is love antithetical to monomania and the Superman theory? So on the, on the Superman theory, uh, that whole thing is that you're, you're above the rest of humanity, and by, by allowing yourself to be bogged down with the emotions from the actions that you took, so... Um, it with murder, if you if he truly was the uh, an Ubermensch, um, he wouldn't want this feeling of forgiveness. He would be okay with it, and he could move on. But he's bogged down with the the suffering, and we we start to see uh, Raskolnikov's emotions more, and that's very uh, opposite to the Superman theory. Yeah, uh, I mean, on the sim simplest level, I think love of another, I guess we'd have to add that in there, it requires two people and kind of equal footing and monomania and Superman, they're all about singularity and being above others. So, um, so now that you've read <coughs> this other Lazarus, right, the question is, um, how is this just significantly relevant to part five? So just kind of finding a, a, a link between this story and both stories. Um, what do you guys think? All right, so after reading this story, it kind of seemed to me like uh, Sonia is sort of a parallel to Lazarus. I mean, they both suffer during life, and because they have good intentions and they're faithful, they're going to be comforted in the afterlife. And um, Raskolnikov is sort of a parallel to the rich man. Although he's not rich, like, they've both sinned in life, and they kind of have this übermensch thing where they think that they can get away with it. Um, so there's also this piece about how the rich man's 
five brethren, like the question of whether they're going to listen to Moses and be saved or just continue with their ways. And Raskolnikov kind of has that issue too. Either he's going to listen to Sonia and go do hard labor with her and the quote that Nathan brought up, suffer together and bear the cross together, or whether he's just not going to do that. Yeah, it almost kind of, I wasn't even thinking about it until now, um, kind of asked that question of Raskolnikov, like, is talking to Sonia enough, or do you need to talk to somebody bigger? Um, yeah. Than that? Um, and then just the, the direct imagery of just the force of money and how that mm -hmm. those, like, I always think of it as this, like, dark uh, den of, like, money and, and greed at the beginning of Part 5 with those two guys, particularly Lucian there with his abacus just counting his, his money. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, a second kind of idea that we had was that Lazarus and the rich man are sort of representations of, like, why Raskolnikov committed the crime. Um, and, like, what he wants it to be is, like, is Lazarus, where he sort of, you know, was a beggar. He did it for the money, and he admits to Sonia that if it had been about the money, if it, like, had been about helping his family, he wouldn't be suffering but, and is much happier, but... Instead, he's sort of is like the rich man who thinks he's better than everyone else, and and um, you know now the the rich man is in hell, kind of suffering, and that's sort of what Raskolnikov is destined for. Yeah, and kind of the heaven and hell thing. Like, there's no middle. Like, you go this way or that way. It's kind of reminiscent of parts of the novel where they're like, there's the option of of suicide or regret. That idea of you can't stay here in the middle. Um, you've got to choose one way or the other. Um, it's interesting to consider. Here's the question. Consider the plot and figurative significance between the depravity at the beginning of part five. So that would include the scene with Lusion and Mani, right? The planted 100 ruble note, the debauched dinner scene. And juxtapose that with the next several scenes, right? Andre's entrance, him kind of like saving the day. I, I wrote Raskolnikov's awakening only because he's there and he's very much an observer until I think it's page like 401 where he stands up and he kind of jumps in to that conversation and ultimately uh, Lucian's defeat uh, which is right before the moment where Raskolnikov really goes to Sonia's room and admits to, to the murder so there's this real swing uh, in, the, in a different uh, direction what do you think? Well, actually, uh, we came up with how sort of uh, a number of things contributed to uh, the the sort of the journey over the course of it. First of all, um, sort of the uh, Andre says that the environment is the uh, at one point in earlier in part five he says the environment the man is nothing but the environment is is I don't know what what truly matters or what what shapes the man. And during the uh, the entire whole like debauched dinner scene, there's sort of these this contrast between Lucian and uh, Raskolnikov, who've been foils up to this point, um, and sort of the crowd, how the, the crowd receives this whole argument that's going back and forth, changes and changes and evolves, and it's showing kind of almost the environment and how it's um, journeying from the crowd being more estranged from Raskolnikov and Sonya to eventually supporting him. Um, and that's kind of shows Raskolnikov on a journey of redemption. Um, and almost disproves the Ubermensch theory because in fact it's not Raskolnikov that saves um, Sonya really, it's it's Andre who is this, uh, guy, this thoughtful guy who talks about this society where everyone's equal, in which case there'd be no need for an Ubermensch. There wouldn't be an Ubermensch, and there'd be no people like the pawnbroker who would need an Ubermensch to settle them. Yeah, so we just talked about how we thought that Raskolnikov and Lusion have been foils, and so as Lusion, Lusion begins, is portrayed as very wealthy and generous and kind, and um, Katerina really wants him to come, and um, Raskolnikov, as well as the rest of the guests at the dinner, are portrayed as um, sort of weak and uncivilized, and then there's this switch where all the other characters are redeemed, especially Raskolnikov, Raskolnikov and Illusion is defeated, 
So sort of as Raskolnikov is rising, Luzhin is falling, so they're sort of contrasting each other. We look at this sort of from two perspectives. Like one is like the actual, if you were to argue this in court, what she would do, but also from sort of more of a metaphorical standpoint and how like knowing what we know from his, of his thoughts from the book, how you can look at it in different ways. And for both, we just dismiss the first one because his whole psychology in committing the murder was, can I do something horribly wrong and not feel it? Yeah, and he knew it was horribly wrong. Like the, the entire premise is that he knows it's something horribly wrong, and so therefore saying he didn't know it was wrong, basically e everything about the crime contradicts that. And then from more of a legal standpoint, we talked about um, the Durham we could kind of argue in the sense that he had the... He had the fever afterwards, and the doctor came, and he has sort of like witnesses to say that he had some sort of mental diseases, in which case he wasn't fully in control of his actions. And there are some quotes in the actual murder scene where it's, um, he says, let me just find it, he, like, um, he was scarcely aware of himself, or he, act, he almost mechanically acted, so there's this set, or later, if he, was, like, if he had only been, been able to see reason more properly, there's sort of this sense of him being out of touch with reality. And also, uh, the Durham rule says that moral blame should not attach. So while at the time, Raskolnikov may have thought that he himself could be a good guy, as the Uber mentioned, still do bad things. Um, you know, he thought that, but moral blame does attach in this case, because he was doing a bad thing, even if it, in that scenario, he didn't, or situation, he didn't think it made him a bad person. But he still knows he did a bad thing, so the Durham rule doesn't apply either. Yeah. Which yeah. leaves us with the Manchester rule. Uh, so this, the Manchester rule says that it's insanity because he, the actions are the result of the mental disease. Uh, I like to say that a lot of uh, crime is motivated by, you know, living in abject poverty. He had a situation that caused him to be very stressed that, uh, you know, was exacerb exacerbated by various environmental factors that resulted in the crime. So it was, uh, it was a, a mental disease in that it, he was just very stressed and very uh, kind of disoriented by a situation. So uh, if we look prior to the crime, we know he uh, you know, he was living in extreme poverty, which was a problem. He also had his, you know, uh, hopes of a university education dashed by a lack of income. And he'd also been humiliated by this pawnbroker, which I think gave him, like, somebody to focus all his anger on. Uh, and then also, he'd been, like, cajoled by, like, a police officer and some random civilian who, like, said, okay, it would be okay if you killed this person, even though they weren't telling him that they should kill uh, the pawnbroker. They still rationalize the behavior to him, which in a sense kind yeah. of gave him like a, almost like a, an alternate personality inspired by this environment yeah. that went on and mechanically kind of murdered yeah. this uh, pawnbroker. There's also on sort of a more philosophical, metaphorical level, his whole, the, the, one of the reasons you could argue he committed the crime is to see if he was an Ubermensch. And I think like Dostoevsky sort of ultimately says this is a bad theory, it's a bad philosophy. And you could say like a bad philosophy or a bad ideal is like a sort of the philosophical version of mental disease. So like, he has this mental defect, Paradigm. mental yeah, mental disease that just sort of warps his vision of reality. And that's how you know it's that is the res his crime results from that mental disease. And there's also in here that he lacks the substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness. So he's aware that it's wrong, but it's... So I think the whole point of confessing would be to appreciate the wrongfulness, to fully come up to that. And because of this theory he has, this metaphorical disease, he can't do that. So that's why the, like, the, the Manchester rule applies both on a like legal level, but also if you look at it sort of from a metaphorical standpoint. Yeah, and a bad philosophy isn't really an excuse for killing somebody.